got it. Hey, look at that. That's a nice fish. That's a really good fish. That is. Of course, the net is not getting over right now. Of course. He's barely hanging on to it. Anywhere where I can grab it. I need to bed it down. Nice fish. That'll do. There we go. <laughs> Hey folks, Glenn May here with BassResource.com and today let's talk about crankbait fishing in the fall. Now, if there ever was a season for crankbaits, it's the fall. And that's because the bass are up actively chasing balls of bait fish. They're going after shad, they're going after the perch, they're going after bluekill, they're going after all that fish, chasing it all around the lake, actively feeding on bait fish this time of year. And there's no other bait that mimics a bait fish any better than a crankbait. So let's talk about the different ways you can fish it to maximize this time of year. So let's start off with the equipment that I'm using. You gotta have a really good well-matched equipment because these crankbaits, if you notice, you know, these are small treble hooks that are on them. There's not a big bite to them and they're thin wire. So a couple things can go wrong if you're using the wrong equipment. Primarily, you can either rip the hooks right out of the fish's mouth or you can actually bend the hooks. I've had hooks, I've lost fish. I had a six pound fish on, six pound smallie I caught in the fall once and he jumped and threw the hook and I'm like, oh great, that was wonderful. And I brought it back. Well, I had two treble hooks that were sticking straight out. It just bent them out and came off that way because I tried to horse them in. I, I clamped down on the drag and I was trying to horse that fish in and I had the wrong rod, it was too stout, and it, everything went wrong. So you've got to have matched equipment for these treble hooks. Okay, so light wire hooks, small bite means you can't have stout equipment. You're going to run into those, you're going to lose a trophy fish if, that, if you do that. So what I've got here is a medium power moderate action rod. Okay, it's got a lot of give and flex to it. Okay, that's what you want. Because, first of all, it allows you to fire that crankbait way out there long distances, but it also has that spring and that give. When you're fighting the fish back to the boat, this rod's going to give a little bit and, uh, and take some of the pressure off those hooks. I'm also using a uh, fluorocarbon line. I like using fluorocarbon in a Seaguar Tatsu line. This is 12 pound Tatsu line. Tatsu casts really well. It's silky smooth, nice line. Fluorocarbon has that give to it. It's got a little bit of stretch to it. So if the fish surges, that fluorocarbon is going to help work in concert with the rod to give a little bit when that fish uh, takes off. Plus, it's got super sensitivity. And you would think, you know, you don't have to have that all that sensitivity because when a fish hits your crankbait, you're going to know it, right? Not so much. A lot of times what happens is that the crankbait's moving along the water, a fish will come up behind it and he'll grab it. And if he doesn't like what he feels, it doesn't feel as natural to him, he'll blow it out. And you won't tell the difference unless you're using some real sensitive line. You'll feel the, you can feel the vibration of that crankbait and I'll go tick, 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 and I'll go to a thud, 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 thud. Or you'll just kind of lose the feel with it. It'll, it won't feel light, but it'll just suddenly feel weird. That's the best way I can explain it. It doesn't feel right. And that's oftentimes when the fish does that. Pulls up behind it, it's matching the speed, he closes his mouth around it, it changes the action of that lure. And you're not gonna feel that if you're using, say for example, just mono or something like that. It's hard to feel those bites. I don't use braid because braid has two things. It's buoyant, not that it floats per se, but it's buoyant. So you're gonna have a bow in the water. You're not gonna have a great connection with the bait. It's not gonna let that crankbait get down to the depth that it should. Plus, it doesn't have any give at all. It, no stretch whatsoever, and that's absolutely contradictory to what you need when you're using these, these treble hooks. So I don't use any braid. For that reason, I don't use braid to fluorocarbon or any kind of leaders. I don't want braid at all when I'm using crankbaits. I don't want that to be part of the equation. I know fluorocarbon's pretty expensive, so I'll put braid backing on here. So I only have to put, say, 80, 80 yards fluorocarbon on there. That way, my package of fluorocarbon will last longer. That's a good cost-effective way of doing it, but I don't use like a liter per se. And then what I'm also doing here, one of the small things to note is I'm using a snap. 
not a snap swivel, but a snap. I don't like to use snap swivels because a swivel will collect weeds and gunk and stuff like that. I just use a snap and the reason I'm doing it is because during the fall when you're chasing these bass down, you're going to be at different depths, you're going to find a different cover, we're going to get into that in a minute and there's different ways of fishing it. And so it's a lot easier to switch up baits when you got a snap instead of having to retie every time you need to change baits. So that's the equipment I'm using. I'm using this, by the way, the, the reel. This is a Helios Air reel. Real nice, it's fast. It's got a fast gear ratio. It's a seven to five, seven five to one gear ratio. And that's what you need to get it cranked down really quickly down to the down to the level it needs to be at. And you're gonna cover water pretty quickly. We're gonna get into that technique in just a second. But that's what you need in a nice smooth, smooth drag to go in concert with everything else you have here. When that fish surges and takes off, everything gives, including the drag. You don't want that drag like that yanking on it because that's just gonna pull that hook free from that fish. Nice smooth drag is what you want. So that's the equipment I'm using. Now let's go fish it. So in the fall, what I like to do is I break it up into basically two pieces. There's the first half where it's late summer into early fall, and you're, that's when the water temps get all the way down to the mid-50s or so. And then the latter half of fall, which is from the mid-50 water temperature down to all the way down to the low 40s, early winter. That's kind of what I'm talking about is, as far as uh, the two seasons. Crankbaits. The, the approach and the wet crankbaits I use and where I fish them change those two halves. So on the first half, fish are up moving, they're actively feeding, they're chasing down bait fish, and so you need to cover a lot of water to find them. So what I tend to do is I, I go, uh, I start a kind of methodical approach. I look for bays and coves that have fresh water coming into them. The bait fish are looking for um, oxygen rich water and that fresh flowing water is what brings in that oxygen rich water. So if a bay or cove doesn't have fresh water moving into it, I skip it and I move to the next one. And I start by working the outside parts of that of that uh, that cove with deeper diving crankbaits. I want to fish the points, the humps, the ridges, the ledges, that kind of stuff, rock piles that are sitting out there in deeper water. And for that I use a deeper diving crankbait, one that's got a nice wide, wide wobble. So one that's got a big bill like this. That's what I'm fishing. It does this nice sachet, side to side sacheting. It's got a lot of action to it. It's got some rattle to noises to it. And I want to fish a bait that it goes deeper than the area I'm fishing. So if I'm fishing in 10 feet of water, I want that crankbait to dive down to 12 to 15 feet of water. I want it banging off the rocks. I want it digging up silt and you know, kinds of mud and making a ruckus. Because crankbait is excellent for uh, calling in bait fish from long distances, which is exactly what you need when you're searching, trying to find them. So it makes an excellent search, search bait. So that's how I fish the outside portion. And then I move in shallower, and I'm still using that crankbait up until it's too shallow to use. But I'll throw it at anything that I can, any kind of cover that I can find, be it uh, chunk rock or docks or laydowns, that sort of stuff. I'll be fishing that. And I also use a square bell like this. The square bell is great for doing that because you can bounce it and deflect it off that cover. It's going to go off at, a, at, a, at an odd angle. And oftentimes that's what triggers a bite. If it just deflects off the cover and bang, the fish will, will hit it with that change of action. Or sometimes when you bang into something, what you want to do if you're using a floating crankbait, let it hit and then pause and let it float up a little bit. It looks like a stunned bait fish that just ran into something that's a little disorientated and that'll trigger a, a bite. So there's two different ways, but you want it hitting that cover. Two different ways you want to fish that cover. There's one just to let it ricochet off and the other one to let it pause. And then I'll fish uh, over the tops of weed beds 
those vast weed beds and those coves, that all use something like a Booyah One Knocker, a lipless crankbait. That's one of these. One of these right here. This works really good fishing those big weedy areas or big flats with lots of stumps and chunk rock in them. And I'll cover water quickly with it. I'm throwing a half ounce bait now and I'm making long casts and just burning it back just under the surface. Getting that reaction strike. Getting that fish to come up out of the weeds and smack it. You really want to get that reaction strike so you fish it pretty hard and heavy that time. And you'll catch a lot of fish doing it that way. You can also use that on the outside weed lines. You can jig it along the weed lines with that with that bait. Let it fall and then let's sit along the weed line and bring it back up. A lot of times I'll hit it when it falls. So it's a great way to fish a lipless crankbait this time of year. If I'm not getting bit along those areas, then I'll go out and I'll fish the, the main channels, the, the creek channels in those bays. I want to fish the inside uh, bends, uh, creek bends that, are, that swing up closer to the shoreline or intersect with a point or a uh, sandbar or something like that. The inside bend, that's the shallower part of that creek bend, usually it has some kind of cover on it. Chunk rock, stump field, weed bed, something like that. That's where the bait fish can set up on and that's a great way to take a crankbait and pull it right across the top of it. That, that one knocker is really good because you, you bring it across the weeds. If you get it in the weeds a little bit, then give it a quick yank and yank it up over the top. That change in direction, that sudden movement often triggers a bite. So it's a really good way of fishing those lipless crankbaits this time of year is just giving a quick yank every once in a while and pause and continue to fish it. If at any point I get a fish, this is where it's hard because now you've been fishing fast, covering lots of water, and now you catch a fish. And the first thing that goes in your mind is, oh, well, that's how I catch fish. So I'm going to keep doing that. Don't. You actually got to pull the ripcord. Let that parachute fly out, slow down, and now methodically cover that area because you found that school of fish. They school up this time of year in packs of three to 25 or more bass will we'll be chasing those bait fish. And if you catch one, there's likely more in that immediate area. So you really got to slow down and methodically fish that area. Crisscross it at different angles. I like to throw a buoy or marker out or something so I know where I'm at and just cover everything I can with all the different types of crankbaits that I've got, the shallow and deeper diver and lipless crankbaits and I'll pick up a lot more fish. Now, if I, if, when the bite dies off after doing that, you've got a choice. There's two different things you can do. If, say for example, I'm on a really good piece of cover or a piece of structure, like whatever it may be, but if it looks real juicy and that, and that had a good large concentration of fish, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll sit on that spot and I'll wait for the next school to come by because it's likely they're going to set up shop on that as well. And I may only have to wait 15, 20 minutes for the next school to happen by and the action picks up again and I catch more fish. I've actually won tournaments doing that technique. But that can be a gamble because it may not be as good of a spot as you think it is and you may be waiting for a long period of time and nobody shows up. They don't want to come play. So <laughs> you may be wasting your time but it's something worth trying if you're on a really good spot. But if the bite dies down and you don't want to sit on that spot, then pick up sticks and take off down the shoreline again. Back to fishing aggressively, back to fishing fast until you connect with that next school of fish and then slow down, methodically work it again. Now, the second part of fall, we fish a little bit different. This is when that water's cooling down and now it's getting closer to winter. Those fish are going to pull away from those shallow areas. The weeds are dying off. When the weeds die, they're going to consume oxygen. And like I said before, the bait fish are looking for oxygen rich water. So they're going to abandon those areas where weeds are dying. They're going to move out to the deeper weeds, to that outside weed line in the deeper water from 10 to 20 feet, 25 feet deep. That's a good area to target with a crankbait. The one that dies real down deep, uh, deep down in that area. But I'll change it a little bit. I'll go to a tighter wiggling crankbait, narrower barrel, something like that. This one dies down to I think 10 or 12 feet deep. That's excellent for fishing along those, those deeper weed lines. A tighter wiggle bait, it doesn't have as much action, it's not rattling around, making as much movement and that's kind of, you want to mimic the, the activity level of the fish. They're not as aggressive as it gets colder, so you want to get a tighter wiggle not as much movement and that really attracts a lot of bites during the latter half of the fall. So I'm using that to, to plumb the depths along the, those deeper weed lines. A 
along the deeper structure as I move out away from those coves and we're moving to main link points, we're moving to humps, ridges, rock piles, brush piles, those type of things you want to use. You still want to bang along the bottom, but sometimes what I'll do is I'll do more of a pause action now. I'll start banging stuff and I'll pause for a second, look stunned, I'll wait a little bit while. Sometimes I'll use a suspending type crankbait so it doesn't float up as much. And that's a really good way of getting those strikes when the fish are lethargic. As a matter of fact, sometimes what I'll do is I'll go out and did, uh, I'll position the boat shallower and I'll throw out to deeper water and I'll slowly work it uphill. Slowly, just let it slow bang and bounce and just kind of work its way slowly uphill and for that I usually change colors I'll use like a crawdad pattern or crawdad colored crankbait because I want it to look more like a crawdad making its way on up up the uh, the cover so that is an excellent way of catching especially in the in the fall when they're in late fall when they're not aggressively chasing bait fish as far as colors it's a touched upon it there's really only two colors you need one is fire tiger and that's what this is that's just a fire tiger pattern right there. That works everywhere. That is an excellent color to be throwing. Don't be fishing crankbaits in the fall without fire tiger. You just need that color and then any kind of bait fish color. So for example, this color here, you know, kind of a gray silver, you know, that's a sexy shad kind of color. Just any kind of shad color. Those are the two colors you need with the exception of a crawdad pattern when you're fishing it uphill like I just mentioned. Here we go. Better one? Yeah, I bounced it right off a rock. As soon as I hit the rock, bang. Smack it. As soon as it ricocheted off the rock. couple other things to note if it's windy out which we get a lot of that during the fall you get those fronts coming through if it's windy make sure you not only target those banks and coves in the in the shoreline that's getting hit by the wind because that churns up the water there's a lot of oxygen there there and it draws in the bait fish to feed and of course the bass are going to follow but also when it's windy you want to speed up your retrieve because the fish are going to be really aggressive there's areas and lakes that I fish that are void of cover void of fish I never catch them there except when it's windy and if the winds blowing up in that area man oh man it's like every cast right it's crazy and you can't fish it fast enough there's no way you can't you can't fish the bait the crankbait too fast you just load the boat doing that so watch for that in the windy conditions get more aggressive conversely if it's really calm out it's glass smooth now you want to go a much slower retrieve and, and and be a little more methodical in your approach to catch those fish so a couple couple ways to uh, to adjust your retrieve based on the weather conditions but that's basically how I fish crankbaits during the fall I hope that helps for more tips and tricks like this visit bassresource.com